Okay, hello and welcome to episode 63 of the Market Maker podcast, where I'm joined by co-founder and head of trading peers, Curran, to talk about what's been going on in markets this week. But to start the episode, quick heads up, we're going to give you the breakdown of the mega cap earnings report. So the likes of Apple, Apple Amazon, Meta, Alphabet, Microsoft, we'll delve into those numbers uh, in a moment. But I've kind of made a promise or a pact with myself that I wouldn't mention that guy on Twitter's name what guy? this this week. <laughs> what guy? Yeah, you know, you know that guy. <laughs> he, he, he's been uh, tweeting like a maniac, like normal. So um, it's hard to avoid him. But yeah, not going to say his name. But yeah, there's been so much to unpack for the week. I thought we'd be here all long bank holiday weekend to get <laughs> through it all. So I thought what's more prudent is a couple of things I just want to say about the Amplify Me community, a couple of shout outs, some really cool stories that I've received, even in the last hour, that I would just want to quickly mention, and then we'll go straight into the, the juicy stuff on the market side. So um, first off, had some really great feedback from the interview that I did with the uh, Chief Investment Officer at Barclays, Will Hobbs, um, earlier this week. Um, so thank you for the comments and, and the likes and the shares and stuff like that. Super appreciate that. Uh, Will is such a accommodating guy and i'm sure as you said at the end of the podcast he's absolutely happy to have people connect with him on linkedin just drop in that you listen to the amplify me podcast and yeah there you go a cio in your network doesn't get better than that <laughs> so look i encourage you to take advantage of that seriously because um you know he might not be able to apply to everyone and immediately but uh, you know if you it's always great to open up a perspective comment to someone with a hook you've got the hook now you know the podcast so yeah hopefully that helps then quick shout out to elliot rumble a physics student at manchester uni so a physics student yep. who did the finance accelerator performed very well got fast tracked to our partner morgan stanley and today they just called him and they've hired him Nice. <laughs> so he's going to be joining the sales and trading division in summer of 2023. So a lot of pre-planning there, of course, some of our, our partners, but uh, <laughs> we're always very vigilant in that regard. But yeah, what an amazing uh, thing to achieve for, for Elliot as an individual. But for us, I mean, that is exactly the mission. Um, and a physics student, that's amazing. So no, great to see. So well done, Elliot. Then also a quick shout out to William Hunter, did our summer analyst program last year. He's landed an internship with Market Access. Uh, Shreya Anil and James Daly, who both Will and I had met up with individually this week, uh, they've just celebrated their first year at Capital Group and Morgan Stanley, respectively. So yeah, well done, guys. Uh, but look, let's, let's jump straight in then into this mega cap conversation. And to kick it off, uh, I know you're a stats man, um, Piers. So I've got some good... good um, figures or as i should say comparables that you oh, might yeah. enjoy here so first off i was trying to remember what was the acronym that you used to describe the the text i think it was fat man wasn't it fat man, yeah. fat man. so the one that, that i read today was uh mat man so cl close because what they're doing is they're throwing in a few more here so we've got microsoft apple amazon tesla meta alphabet nvidia is right. the other one Video being yeah. actually a very large company these days. Well, um, my fat man, my fat man was before Facebook changed their name to Meta. Okay, so so, so you are then the uh, the oracle really for these things when it comes very, to. Very <laughs> <laughs> so so the the first figure, if the Matt man has shed almost two point one trillion US dollars of equity value since the start of the year. So just the start of the year, it's just over two trillion. Yeah. However, to put this in a bit of perspective, Apple alone is still worth nine times Coca Cola, fourteen times Nike, twenty-five times Target, and forty-two times Uber. Let's look at one of the other big names. Meta <laughs> has lost the approximate value of J.P. Morgan or eight Twitters just this year and then tesla 
you know, it's been where well, it got whacked and no surprise because that guy who was dumping some of his Tesla shares, like you said last week, <laughs> to finance yeah. his new deal. Um, well, he, but, start, yeah, he started selling, yeah. yeah. He, well, yeah, he announced the deal to sell the next day. But anyhow, Tesla remains, uh, remains more valuable than the next 15 automakers in the world combined, even with the fact that they got hammered um, this week. Yeah. That's... I mean, hang on, say that again. What include Tesla's still more valuable than the 15 next biggest? Yeah. Well, including like Volkswagen and Yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, <laughs> the bubble, whilst it, it's burst, the, the the deflation has only just begun. Um, well, actually, well, have you been reading about margin calls for Elon? Oh God, I said it, didn't I? For that man's um financing deal. Yeah. He's having to put up some of his Tesla shares, not as not not selling them to raise cash, which is what he's doing, but also other shares that he's not going to sell. Just he's putting those up as collateral for part of the financing loan. But there's a if if the share price drops below five hundred and fifty dollars, mm. I think it is, then it mm-hmm. triggers a margin call. Those shares won't be valuable enough anymore to 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 have sufficient cap um, to be sufficient collateral for that part of the deal. So. Yeah. Yeah. I got the memo from Bill Gates. He, uh, yeah. he was circulating it to us saying, right, you're going to join the short. <laughs> uh, Michael Burry was on that. There was, um, Bill Gates. We had a, we had a zoom call uh, and I was like, look, you know, my, my 50 quid is not going to help support your short position. <laughs> but, um, well, look, let's, let's go straight in and talk about Amazon first because they got an almighty whack aftermarket last night they were down about 10 percent and that was mainly down to the fact that uh, for q2 net sales forecast missed and this was one of the the headlines i ran with with one of the posts that i did on linkedin which was companies sees q2 net sales of 116 to 121 billion but that's below expectations of 125 billion so we're living in a world where Take 120 billion in a quarter, it ain't good enough <laughs> anymore. But um, but yeah, yeah, what what were your initial thoughts when you saw the Amazon numbers hit? Well, I mean, first of all, you know, this is a problem for well, a lot of these tech firms. Um, it's the comps, right? Because obviously, we're always looking at revenue and we're looking at profit and we're thinking about how fast is it growing. So what was revenue like this time last year? What was profit like this time last year? It's always right. What's it like compared to 12 months ago? And the, and the issue that the likes of Amazon have is that 12 months ago, I mean, everything was just through the roof because we were all locked down. And, and obviously companies like Amazon hugely benefit from that particular quite unique situation. So 12 months on when we're not locked down, or well, I should say we're not locked down in let's say the West, Um, obviously China is locked down, um, but perhaps that lockdown came in more in April actually. So it didn't particularly impact um, quarter one, which is what these earnings are about. But yeah, the comps, I mean, on the one hand, their revenue did still go up like 7% year on year, right? And half of me thinks, well, that's quite remarkable in itself given where we were 12 months ago. Um, But of course, you know, it's about revenue growth rates and their revenue, whilst it went up 7%, that's, you know, much slower growth than we're used to from these just phenomenal companies. Um, And, you know, the other thing I'd say is it's it's quite, they've got a couple of, I mean, I guess one of the big headlines was that the company recorded a 3.8 billion net loss in the quarter. And you're, you know, the word loss is definitely not associated with these big giant fangs. And, um, you know, when you start getting lost, like with with Meta, you know, the loss or Netflix, the loss of subscribers, you know, or here in in Amazon's case, you know, quarterly um, net loss is kind of, wow, that's just, that shouldn't happen. And And the issue they've got is that their share prices are so high that the only thing that can sustain the price they're at or the continued upside trajectory is just phenomenal off the scale numbers every single time. 
And when they don't have phenomenal off the scale numbers, then right, well, the share price isn't justified. And so you're getting some pretty sharp downside. One thing that was kind of sneaked in the kind of detail here with Amazon, and really the reason for their loss was because they, um, they had a one-off item where they wrote down their Rivian shareholding um, by, they took is a 7.6- Rivian still alive? <laughs> they took a 7.6 billion loss write down on their Rivian investment. Um, so that's basically that's their that's their net quarterly loss right there, and and then some. So you know, there's there's little things in there, but look, obviously it's their, you know, their their kind of the the, the retail side. Yeah, fine. Obviously, the comp for year on year was, was tricky, but um, you know, when you when you look at things like AWS, then mm. actually it was phenomenal. Right. Um, it's just that AWS only only has a revenue clocked in at eighteen point four billion for the quarter, right? So obviously, when you sit that alongside, it's just mega kind of retail arm. Eighteen point four billion gets lost, but if AWS was its own company, let's say, they would, but we'd be kind of mm. shouting and screaming, "This is amazing!" Their AWS share price, if such a thing existed, would have been through the roof because that eighteen point four billion that's up thirty seven percent year on year. So actually, if you took AWS out, this earnings report would have looked way worse. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, AWS is still still nice and strong. Can they um, not do that? Like uh, the, the restructuring that, that Facebook has gone through or is going through, now that Facebook reports like the Reality Labs figures, they report like Facebook figures. Yeah. Can that Amazon not engineer something to just detract well, their attention towards more where they want it on AWS? Well, they do. I mean, it's it's Facebook that was slow on that. Amazon do split out their numbers and they do mm. report their AWS numbers suppose, as yeah. kind of its own category, right? It's just that we're used to that with Amazon. That's what they've always done. I'm just saying if AWS happened to have been its own separate entity in terms of a, a company listed, you know, then obviously the focus is all on the amazing growth that that side's um, bringing. But look, overall, you know, Amazon, they're overstaffed. Um, they invested an insane amount of money through the pandemic to take advantage of that incredibly unique lockdown situation. They invested hugely in you know, warehousing, they invested hugely in the number of employees. It peaked at 1.7 million. That's the number of employees, which is just an insane figure. Mm. Um, so then now they're having to reduce it. And actually they're already, in, in quarter one, they they axed 100,000 people. <laughs> wow. um, so they took it from 1.7 million down to 1.6 million. So they've just, they're just having to r- row back on some of that kind of mega expansion strategy that they implemented in in when covid was 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 around the world and there they're just having to hmm. you know I, I guess it's incredibly difficult to try and you know running a business of this size is incredibly difficult and certainly from the strategy point of view you know these this, these are massive kind of oil tankers if you like and to change right. direction you know it's not like companies like let's say amplify right we're really small certainly you know relatively and it just means that we're much more nimble and if we if we see a kind of speed bump coming up well then right we can quickly you know we're nimble and we can dart around and change direction and change up strategy but when you're amazon i mean think about it if you want to set about firing 100,000 people well that 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 in itself is an absolute monster exercise it's easier to fire them by the way than it is to hire them so imagine having to hire 100,000 people um, and this is one of the issues they've had on the costs side, because they were having to, obviously there's a shortage of labor, right? People are, companies can't find staff and they were having to pay, I think it was $1,000 sign on bonuses yeah. just to get the people in through the door. Right. So yeah, they're just so big that strategy is difficult. And when you get something like COVID, which has been almost impossible to kind of predict, right. Um, it's just a bit of a COVID hangover. And that's what these quarterly figures show. Okay, well, look, let's um, let's move on then to the next candidate, <laughs> Alphabet. Their shares were down initially five percent after they. I'm talking about the aftermarket 
the immediate aftermath, if you like, of the numbers hitting, uh, missing on top and bottom lines, and a big miss on their YouTube revenues. I mean, the YouTube thing, I don't know the exact details, but it makes the YouTube thing kind of makes sense. Yeah. Because COVID restrictions in their key, let's say, markets, North America, namely, uh, but even in Western Europe, are radically different. And so the consumption, I would say, I'd like to see a stat on the average active user's time consumption on YouTube, I would have thought has gone, gone down. And wow. so less marketing opportunity. Oh, you're going to prove wow. me wrong now. <laughs> wow. I've got a stat to uh, throw back in your face on that last time. All right. Okay. Because this is something they pointed out in the um, earnings call. Hmm. Um, they said actually really quite surprised. And it was a way of them to try and say, guys, don't worry. I know YouTube revenues. I mean, by the way, again, YouTube revenues rose 14% year right. on year. And remember, this is a year-on-year -year comp that's phenomenally difficult to beat, given where we were 12 months ago. But it still grew at 14%, clocking in at 6.9 billion. It's just the problem was that was a lot lower than the 7.5 billion that analysts had expected. Um, but the way they tried to spin it was actually they said uh, YouTube more than two billion has more than two billion monthly users. Apparently, they were spending more time on the platform, even as people have returned to in-person activities. So apparently, their user usage time's gone up. Which I'd, li yeah. I'd like to see the official submission of that paper, please. Hey, I'm just I'm just <laughs> messaging. Um, but yeah, I mean, like company, it's certainly like Google. I mean, Amazon. They always sell close to the wind. What I mean by that is their margins are pretty tight, okay? Mm -hmm. Because their, you know, the nature of their business um, is a logistics business, and it's incredibly uh, you know, there's a huge amount of cost that goes with having physical warehouses and delivering physical products and all the rest of it. Obviously, companies like Google don't have all of that infrastructure that's so insanely expensive, and so. You know, Amazon's always sailed a bit close to the wind. When Amazon report a loss, it's like, okay. But when when Google miss on the top line and the bottom line, I can't, I honestly, have you got a stat? When did that last happen? Yeah, I can't remember. Did it, has it ever happened? I mean, it's quite insane. Mm. Um, that's why it's so surprising. And they're like, wow, okay. Um, but when you think about the macro environment, you know, I mean, we've all talked, maybe touch on some GDP figures in a minute, but look, we are heading for a slowdown, um, surely, right? And, and when it comes to companies looking to cut costs, then one of the first items on the list is, is marketing spend, um, because it's easy to cut that cost. You know, we talk about staff and laying staff off. Well, that takes a long time and it's expensive, right? But you can turn your marketing off immediately. It literally takes you one second. Right, I've gone to Google AdWords, bang, turn the campaign off, right? So it's often one of the first items that, that kind of, that, that gets reduced. So Amazon, particularly with their YouTube revenues are particularly vulnerable to, to the macro um, climate. So I don't think it's too much of a, of a surprise. Um, well, look, let's, let, let's slip in quickly that GDP print. Yeah, okay. Because we want to keep it on, this, on these tech companies' focus. So the GDP number came out earlier this week, and it was a surprise because it was expected a plus, so a positive 1% growth. And what we got was a negative 1.4% print, which was much lower than even the most pessimistic estimate on the street. And what I mean by that is of all the surveyed big investment banks who submit then their estimate of what they think, which generates then this kind of expectation, even the most pessimistic one got it, wasn't pessimistic enough, basically. So this was a, this was a, uh, a surprise. Um, there was some detail about reflecting growing trade imbalances and weaker inventory growth, which perhaps you could explain right. what that is yeah. first before we um, go into it more. Yeah, so, so this is the US quarter one GDP figure, and bang, it's negative, and everyone, immediate, the immediate reaction is, oh, what? Okay, wow, it's, it's happening sooner than we thought, right? That this whole kind of 
recession risk and it's already here. And that's the initial reaction. But actually, if you step back and look under the bonnet of this, then you can explain it away. And it's most likely not going to be the case that quarter two is also going to be negative. So here, here, here's why. So it's actually down to inventory. Well, so it's down to the trade deficit, okay, which is looking at measuring the, uh, the value of goods that you import versus the value of goods that you export, okay? And if you've got a def deficit, then you're importing more. And obviously a company like, uh, sorry, a country like the US, hugely rich, massive, the, the biggest rich economy on the planet, they're obviously importing way more than they export, right? Um, and because we've come out of the pandemic in, in the US, let's say in quarter one, then companies are restocking, right? They're building back up their inventory levels. Um, because they're expecting sales to go up because lockdown's over, right? And people are coming out and spend and the labor market's really strong and so on, right? So they, they have a temporary increase in orders in order to build up their inventory and stock to meet what they think is going to be new demand. Now, most of this is actually imported goods. So what we had was uh, a an, uh, uh, probably a temporary widening of the trade gap, of the trade deficit, more imports, and actually exports dropped. And exports dropped for two reasons. Number one, well, in other countries, certainly in China, right? Well, there's lockdowns. And so the demand side isn't as strong, but also, I don't know if you noticed, and I don't know if we'll have time this time round, but the dollar has been rampant. I mean, my Lord, the, some of the FX moves, some of the levels we're seeing on some of these FX markets are crazy. So the dollar has been really strong, which makes US exports more expensive, right? So the, the overall effect is that actually that's a negative impact on GDP, because if, you, if your trade deficit widens, think about it, if you're buying a product, but that money is going to an international company based in China or based in Europe, then actually... That, that money is leaving the country, right? So it has less of a GDP positive impact than, so it's only got one half of the deal, if you like, um, that's the buying part, but then the money leaves. So if, you're, if you buy a, a product from a domestic company, then obviously the money stays inside the economy and the person who's selling receives that money and then they might take that money and go buy something else that's in the domestic economy. And so you have that effect. So there's been a temp probably a temporary widening of the trade deficit, which has had this technical negative impact on GDP that's most likely not going to be sustained into quarter two. Now, later in the year, may be different as the headwinds like inflation and interest rates going up, and who knows about the Russia-Ukraine thing, probably ongoing, right? So maybe those headwinds will start to become strong enough to actually create, create a proper recession. But most likely what we have right now isn't, isn't a recession and probably won't be. Okay. Thank you for the thorough as ever explanation. Absolutely crystal. But um, the link then between that and alphabet and then leading us into Apple, putting us back on track was buybacks. Oh, yes. So Alphabet is to buy back an additional 70 billion, 70, I said, seven zero yeah. in class A and C shares. And then Apple's authorized 90 billion buyback. So perhaps you could just quickly just have a comment on the buybacks, the rationale, and then we can get into the numbers with Apple. Um, this is a this is a very uh, this is a key strategy amongst big tech. OK, it's a it's across all of them. It's not just Apple and, and Amazon either. I mean, even like even Meta, given how badly they're doing, even they're kind of I got a full blown share buyback program. Right. And there's kind of two main reasons you would do it, I would say, broadly. Number one is if you're quite a cash generative business. And obviously, these tech giants are they've got insane amounts of cash. And whilst, you know, you know, the business kind of 101 is, well, if you've got excess cash, well, obviously, great. Well, like, reinvest it in growing your business, right? But these tech firms have got so much cash, they just don't know what to do with it. 
So they're buying back shares or they're increasing dividends, which Apple did as well, by the way. And so this is returning some of that cash to their owners, that's the shareholders, okay? So one reason is they, they got so much, they're not quite sure there isn't enough kind of growth strategies for them to kind of spend it on, right? Number two, it is incredibly, it's a very positive thing for your earnings report. And that's because when we value businesses, there's so many different valuation multiples, but perhaps the most, the one everyone knows about is the PE ratio. That's price to earnings, okay? And it's based on the number of shares. So we're looking at profit per share, okay? So one way of engineering uh, a kind of nice steady upward trajectory where your profit per share is always increasing, which looks amazing and what, and what a great business. Well, actually, a lot of it is engineered by reducing the number of shares. So even if your profit stays the same, if your number of shares is consistently reducing, then your earnings per share is steadily increasing, right? So it's a kind of uh, clever kind of accounting engineering trick to massage up the, mm. the look and feel of your earnings year on year. Um, and I would say for the likes of Apple, especially, they are becoming, because they've got the biggest program of all on the share buyback and on the dividend side. And they really are becoming, and if I'm becoming, maybe they have become the best safe haven out there because they're such a huge company uh, and so well established with phenomenal products and amazing kind of global reach. But also, if you own their shares, you're going to get loads of money because their dividends are pretty much guaranteed now and they're guaranteed to increase, mm. right? So that's, that's income for you. Mm. And as, they, as they're buying back shares, well, great, you're, you're steadily actually owning a greater percentage of the business. Um, so... You know, this is one of the things, factors that's underpinning the phenomenal performance of these fangs. Is that it's not just the tech and the growth rates, and it's actually also the amount of cash they generate and their preparedness to give it back to the shareholders. Yeah, well, one um, one line that I saw from them that I thought was surprising was their fastest growing region. I mean, I guess that makes sense in the context of what's happening in China, but in the Americas their sales rose 20 percent in the quarter in america that's a pretty decent jump uh, that that alone in that region was just over 50 billion yeah um, the wearables home accessory categories including the watch apple tv uh home pod mini airpods these sorts of things um, that did miss though but their services revenue grew 17 percent, which was actually slightly above projections uh, so i thought they were some of the more granular details that were quite interesting but the big the big thing that well i mean i look at this stuff as it hits the tape and i follow the aftermarket when it breaks and their shares initially popped because you were like wow big beat nine percent revenue increase authorizes buy back shares actually spiked about two three percent and then they came out shortly after and said actually uh we predict that supply constraints would cost between four on the four on the low end to eight billion dollars uh, in revenue during the current quarter, the one that we'll report next, and yeah. that was what sent them into a bit of a tailspin in aftermarket trade. But I mean, the commonality here between these is talking about just what's been happening in the environment, just globally at the moment, because Amazon were the same on the on the conference call. Jassy said the pandemic and the subsequent war in Ukraine has brought unusual growth and challenges, but that is definitely true. But do you think they lean on that a little bit? Because they're, I mean, certainly the growth one, maybe not, but the Ukraine one, you can kind of say, well, look, that, that's a disruptive factor now. You'd only say this, of course, when you've got bad numbers. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you find every excuse you can possibly get, right, right to explain this stuff with, without being... So I should row back on that comment without being stupid. Mm. Um, obviously, you want investors to trust in your ability to manage and run your business. So 
you don't want to find ridiculous excuses to try and explain away and justify you know performance but obviously the russia ukraine thing yeah genuinely has had a negative impact and especially for these advertisers right these these and like people like meta i mean putin switched off facebook like literally um, and Facebook themselves took the decision to not allow any Russian entities to, to, to pay for any marketing on their platform. So, I mean, that's a very direct um, negative, immediate negative impact, right? So, I mean, absolutely, that has played a role here in, in, in some of these figures. And certainly for Apple, yeah, I mean, the, I mean, the supply chain constraints, I mean, it's perhaps more to do with China, than, than necessarily Russia, Ukraine. But um, yeah, the fact that they, I think they lost 6 billion in the December quarter. So that's quarter four of 2021. Um, obviously it's impacted them then in quarter one here. But as you say now, yeah, they're coming out with potentially an 8 billion hit in April, May, June of 2022. I mean, these are, that's a lot of money, right? Even for a, a giant, um, the size of Apple. Um, but yeah, I mean, geographically, as you said, it was interesting. I mean, American sales jumped. I mean, obviously, America came out of lockdown and everyone's kind of, oh, hey, let's go and um, get out there and, I don't know, buy a new iPhone or, or whatever it might be. But yeah, Europe um, Europe rose at 4.6%. So, so the US rose 19 to 20%, right? Europe only 46 uh, China only grew at 3.5%. But actually... Weirdly, even though that's the lowest, people were quite surprised at how good that was, mm. um, given the, the kind of zero tolerance on lockdown that's still going on out there. Japan, oh, well, actually, Japan didn't grow at all, stayed at 7.7 .7 billion. Um, I, I know one thing, like anecdotally, that, you know, my family being based in Hong Kong in China, that the iPhone and Apple's a product is seen as quite a status symbol. Right. It's very different to say here, you'd, you'd gladly play a premium. So probably the affluency of the consumer that would purchase in China is probably not as impacted, say, on that level where, yeah. where to be able to spend, perhaps. Um, one thing I was going to say, Tim Cook did actually say on the call that um, they had a record level of upgraders during the quarter. And we, we grew switches, um, right. strong double digits uh, as well. So... There's yeah, a couple of things going on there in the background as well. I find it interesting, like even like Mac, Max grew at 15% Mac sales, um, which is pretty impressive. The one, the one outlier that actually disappointed on the sales side is the iPad. And those things still around? Right. Well, that's my, that's my immediate reaction. It's like, who, who the hell's buying iPads anyway? But um, Apparently, people are, albeit <laughs> revenues went down. So the iPad revenue dropped by 2%. But do you know how much they made from iPad sales? Well, I do Seven. know, and it's a lot of money. 7.7 <laughs> billion. Yeah. From a products that, hang on, does anybody buy those? Well, yep. Um, they buy a lot of them. Um, mm. Yeah. So, Maybe yeah. But it's on... like enterprise packages for schools or something like that, or like for Maybe. businesses. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. But yeah, Apple on their share buyback, 90 billion they've announced hmm. um, for this year ahead. Um, and then on their, I think their dividends, they've increased their dividends or they're increasing their dividends for, by 5%, which is the 10th straight annual increase. So do you know what's wow. going to happen next year? Going to raise it again. Year after that, going to raise it again. It's a banker. If you want income from share ownership, there literally there's probably no better place uh, to go. And actually, there's, there's some analysis done. They've got so much cash that these share buybacks, they reckon that Apple can, 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 can continue with this policy until at least 2035. Wow. <laughs> Unless something extraordinary, which is we can't, foresee at this point happens 2035 another decade and a bit of just continuing to smash the the kind of share buybacks and tick up those dividend payments wow amazing
Well, look, let's um, let's move on. I'm just a bit conscious of time. So Meta, they actually performed the best. Never thought <laughs> I never thought I'd say that, but their daily active users, their DAUs, which we talked about at length when their shares got hammered the last earnings call, um, they actually moved back into growth territory after the shocking decline that they had seen for the first time on on record. But context, again, as I was writing about the time, was their stock is down almost 50% on the year. Yeah. So you've got to take it in context, I think. <laughs> yeah, that, I mean, this is it. I think you're, I think a lot of investors perhaps you don't spend as much time as others on prop, like due diligence or, or properly you know, understanding a business and understanding its direction and therefore then thinking about its growth potential and all the rest of it. And if, if they're mainly just looking at price, well, you get onto the Facebook chart and you go, my Lord, that has collapsed. It's got to be cheap. It's got to be cheap, right? So, you know, you're getting people buying just from what you'd call a, a relative price sort of mindset. Um, which is perhaps why you know, any hint of a slightly good bit of news from Facebook, people kind of jump in to buy because, hang on, I'm buying at a 50% discount. 50% um, discount from a, an incredibly overvalued price six months ago, but they don't often quite see it like that. So mm. I think you're always going to get, you're going to get some heightened volatility in Facebook shares, now that their share price has dropped so radically, volatility is going to go up, I'd say, especially around earnings reports, as you get, you know, inevitably some good news in, in the mix, and, and people might decide to kind of jump on that, and you get these big spikes. But, but I think, yeah, longer, medium term, you know, Facebook's still where it was before this earnings report, and, that, and that's, you know, an incredibly challenging moment in its history and trying to reinvent itself literally. Um, and, you know, that I guess from the, from the big advertisers out of these techs, so obviously Facebook and obviously um, Google generate most of their revenue from advertising. But the problem Facebook have is their reliance on other um, businesses like Apple to actually generate their eyeballs mm. to see their adverts that people are paying for, right? The thing about Google is, other than, well, the thing about Google is that they, their advertising revenues direct traffic to the Google site. Facebook's advertising revenue relies on going through a third party product like an iPhone. And obviously, this is one of the big things that's impacted them in the last few months where Apple's privacy settings have been tweaked, um, and meaning less eyeballs on Facebook ads. Yeah. And then the, the, the final of the, the big five, as they are, is Microsoft. And I remember many episodes ago, we did our kind of pitch, stock pitch on who we'd go for. Yeah. And uh, yeah. The gray man in the room continues to just go about his business. But I thought an interesting connection to what you said earlier was about if you were to segregate out the AWS part of the logistics business, so to speak, of Amazon and the, uh, that margin situation and the margin differentials between Amazon in those two divisions is, is massive. But for Microsoft, well, Microsoft... Um, quarterly sales earnings tops analyst projections, uh, robust growth in cloud services demand. Shares were up about 7% after market. A, a good quote I saw from Satya Nadella, who's the chief executive, he said, in an inflationary environment, the only deflationary thing is software. Mm. Yes, indeed. Just thought it was a great Great quote. And actually, he said he predicted that tech spending would remain strong, even if ec economic growth slowed. As customers try to counter inflation by investing in systems to increase productivity and automate more of their operations. Yeah. And it's what's great about Microsoft is a lot of it's B2B subscription. Hmm. 
So, right, it's businesses subscribing to, you know, Office, Microsoft Office, right? And the problem, it's not like advertising revenue, which you can just dial up and down. You know, you, you, your business can't function right. if you don't have Office, right? So it's not something you can switch off and on. And so there, I'd say their revenue, their, their big revenue driver, which is through things like Windows and Office, um, are more stable than something like an advertising revenue stream um, like the Googles and the Facebooks have. Yeah, and then some other noteworthy mentions, I, I thought were Intel, the chip maker, they issued a downbeat revenue and earnings forecast for the current quarter. Coronavirus pandemic lockdowns in China, the war in Ukraine combined uh, to hit the outlet for PC sales. And Texas Instruments, one of the most diversified large chip makers, trimmed its growth forecast this week on concern that some Chinese customers would be forced to suspend operations. So everyone's watching China, it seems. Yeah, and well, quite rightly. I mean, I, I, I know that um, uh, uh, we've got staff over in Shanghai, so I know that it's actually early signs. They're slightly now relaxing some of the, um, you know, the major lockdowns, like you're allowed to walk outside of your building not 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 beyond the boundary of your building's kind of garden or whatever but at least it's a step in the right direction however apparently now beijing is starting to see some uh, more restrictions being put into place so yeah we're not it's still pretty dire out there and it's and it's going to have a yeah it's definitely having a major impact of course on the chinese economy but absolutely on the whole supply chain problem globally and the inflation nightmare. Um, so, yeah, I, I, and you're seeing it in markets. I like, if you look at the big indices now, I mean, they are, I think we were talking a few weeks ago and saying, well, look, this isn't really getting priced in properly. And there's got to be more downside for these big indices. And you, you are seeing that now. I mean, the Nasdaq's trading right down on its lowest point for the year. Not, not a new, well, it did set a new low for the year, actually, this week, just, just dropping just below the mid-March low, which was the low that came off the back of the, like the beginning of the Russia-Ukraine situation. Uh, but, you know, the Nasdaq's down 20%. You know, that's, mm -hmm. and, and I, I don't think that's the bottom. Actually, one thing, I don't think you would have seen this. It came out in the overnight session, um, and not many people talked about it, to be honest. But the... Um, South China Morning Post put out a piece citing sources overnight that suggested that China is ending its regulatory storm over big tech. And actually, they're now pivoting and giving the sector, technology, a bigger role in boosting the slowing economy. What? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Bumps, okay. bumps. Well, I mean, look, we're looking at the charts. We're, we're recording this right at the end of the day. On Friday, but actually overnight in Asia, obviously they were loving it. Yeah. Wow. So, so yeah, look, Xi when, Xi when needs must, Piers. Xi Jinping <laughs> admitting he's made a wrong decision and doing a U turn. Well, careful, careful what you say. Xi is not Elon, <laughs> <laughs> he's a much bigger fish. <laughs> but um, look, we'll, we'll end it there. Um, so, look, we haven't had. Time to cover a lot of stuff, just, just so much going on. We have not even mentioned the French elections. Macron obviously won as well, and, and there's yeah. lots of other things. Archer costs back in the news. Uh, our friend Bill <laughs> landing in some hot water again. Seems he was even a, more of a naughty boy than uh, what we thought. But look, we'll end it there for this week's episode. Um, as I started this episode, please do send in um, any of your positive stories and so forth, whether you've landed a role or... Um, you know, just something cool that you want to share and, and I can shout out from the community side. Uh, and also as a favor, if you ever kind of enjoy anything that you hear in any of the podcast episodes, please do share it, um, whether that's on LinkedIn or whatever channels that you use, we'd hugely appreciate it. And, you know, the more people li that listen, hopefully the more people we can help educate. Uh, and also, yeah, and don't forget to, we're still running those finance accelerators uh, they're still happening. If you haven't done one, uh, we'd love to have you on board. So with that, if you're in the UK, have a lovely long weekend, Piers. Thank yes. you as ever. Thank you. Cheers, Anne. Have a good one.
Take care, everyone.